you guys met when you were 15 and 16. Yeah. How old were you when you were married? 21. 21. And 22. So would you say at that age, you two were fully confident making the choice? This is it. I'll never be with anyone else. I'll never crave a sexual war. Be curious about exploring that 21 and 22. Yeah, I, was, yeah. I was extremely confident. Yeah. We've only ever been with each other and we waited until we were married to have sex. Just so excited to have that commitment of it's you and me. There's nobody else right. that I want. As we've been married, it's just been more solidified and even more confident probably than I was then. In this episode, I sit down with my husband and and Amelia and Matt, a couple that practices consensual non-monogamy living in Bali. I came into the relationship knowing that I wanted to be non-monogamous. I'd say the first two years of the relationship were probably the most challenging for me just because it really felt like I was relearning everything I'd ever thought I knew about what love would look like. I'd say our communication is better than many of the monogamous couples we know. Friends who have had sex with people that they are close with, that they often feel a sense of emptiness afterwards, mm -hmm. that it wasn't actually meaningful. Do you ever feel that way? It's almost like an extra, extra topping or something. So if we're gonna do it outside of the relationship, we wanna make sure it's done really well with integrity and empathy and compassion. Oh, my biggest concern would be raising children. So if you're gonna purposely enter into a relationship that has a higher chance of you splitting up, I like to look at risks. That's just the way my mm -hmm. brain works. Amelia and I have been friends for almost a decade and and though we don't see each other often because we live on opposite corners of the world, we've stayed in touch over the years and I was excited to share this conversation together with very opposing perspectives on intimacy, relationships, and sex. We come from polar opposite life experiences. Andrew and I have only ever been with each other intimately. Our marriage vows were based in a lifelong commitment of growth and unconditional love through the hard times and the easy times. Amelia and Matt recently celebrated their love in a non-traditional marriage ceremony after dating for five years. They value freedom, self-expression, and evolution as both individuals and in a partnership. What is the purpose of sex? I think it's to awaken consciousness. For me, I guess I've had a lot of sex, but that one point was like, it was something transformative. Do you feel like your sex can be as deep and intimate with someone you just met versus the person that you are so ride or die with, the person you're in love with, you've been through thick and thin. I've been really interested recently in learning more about like female biology. There's a lot of research coming out that illuminates the fact that women might benefit more from multiple sexual partners. For us, it's not a question of how can we make monogamy perfect? The reality is infidelity always happens. It has since the dawn of time. I kind of look at it as this seeking the next thrill. Is that mm -hmm. always the best thing for your life? Oh, let's try a threesome, let's do a foursome. It sounds very transactional. Is sex meant to be with one person committed for life as a sacred soul tying experience or is that unrealistic and is there value in having multiple partners at the same time or separately throughout your life or is there really no one best way and it really just depends on the person what are the implications for society and children and ourselves that and more is what we get into today enjoy our conversation Okay, you guys, I'll be the first to admit that I love pretty things. So if I find a product that nourishes me and looks beautiful on the kitchen counter, I am all in. Anima Mundi Herbals does just that. They carry organic, wild-crafted, and ethically grown botanicals in the most beautiful packaging. From elderberry syrup and adaptogenic mushrooms to spirulina, chocolate protein, teas, and collagen booster powders, every vibrant and medicinally potent remedy is packaged in eco-friendly packaging, uh, recyclable glass, or biodegradable bags. It was founded by Costa Rican herbalist Adriana Ayalas, who uses over 200 different sustainably grown herbs from around the world to create intentional products that contain zero fillers, binders, or flow agents. Everything is made in the U.S. with certified organic, wild-crafted, and sustainably harvested plants and herbs in a vegan and gluten-free kitchen. I love their high-potency elderberry syrup, which is double extracted. It's adaptogenic, antiviral, organic, and wild-crafted, perfect for supporting healthy immune function. So use my code ELLEN20 for 20% off just click the link in my show notes to get this deal from an amazing company that supports fair trade practices beyond organic farming education and small farmers to create remedies that benefit people from all walks of life I think before we begin, I want to preface what two consenting individuals want to do should be free to do what they want. This is more just a philosophical question on is one more optimal than the other. You agree with that? Yeah, yeah. definitely. Yeah. Okay. So can you guys share a little bit about your story? What led you to non-monogamy and how you guys got together? We met five and a half years ago on a dating app. We quickly kind of realized that because we were living in two separate parts of the world, that maybe dating exclusively or it would be a little bit of a challenge, I guess. I was living mostly in Hawaii and Matt was living in Indonesia. So we kind of started out casually dating, like a little bit long distancey, but still 
a little bit open and just kind of allowing each other to, you know, hey, I might not see you for three months, so let's stay in touch, but um, we'll check back in when we're close to one another. And then, yeah, quickly we discovered we wanted to live together and spend most of the year together for the last five years or so and pretty much been open or ethically and consensually non-monogamous since the start. I, I think we've had, we've had, we've evolved through, I guess I came into the relationship knowing that I wanted to be non-monogamous. Mm -hmm. So it's been, there's been some learning curves and evolution and yeah. creativity that we've had to apply to our relationship. But on the whole, it's been an amazing journey and yeah, couldn't think of anyone else that I would want to do the journey, journey with. Mm -hmm. And when he presented the idea to you when you guys met, has that been was that something you had ever considered before? And what led you to deciding that okay, I want to do this? It was nothing I'd ever considered before. No, nope. I definitely grew up traditional, you know, like beliefs around marriage, finding the one, um, having children, having a family. So, I think at first my immediate reaction was wanting to respect his wishes and his beliefs because um, I, don't, I don't think you mentioned that Matt was in a 14-year monogamous partnership with the mother of his children before dating me. So he, when he came forward and said, you know, I'm pretty sure this is how I want to live my life and this is how I enjoy dating and connecting with women, uh, my immediate reaction was I'm going to be the woman that changes that. <laughs> I'm going to change you so that you don't want to, um, you know, date anyone other than me. And then I think um, slowly I started to introduce myself to like reading material and different books about non-monogamy. And I started seeking out some people on the internet who were practicing non-monogamy and just learning a bit about it. And then obviously through personal experience and us, um, like I said, being apart for such long periods of time quite often, I realized it's kind of fun to be able to go on dates and do things when I'm not with him in person and still be able to maintain the love and the relationship. And so it became more comfortable for me. And But yeah, definitely a huge learning curve. And I'd say the first two years of the relationship were probably the most challenging for me just because it really felt like I was relearning everything I'd ever thought I knew about what love would look like, what a partnership would look like. And um, yeah, it's because I think we created a relationship we didn't really fall back on trying to put out a construct it in anything that we saw externally. Mm -hmm. So everything was sort of as we were going through the evolution of the relationship, we were trying to configure it to best suit the individual self, but then for the individual to come together and function and relate sensitivity and unconditional love and listening and all those things mm -hmm. the best that we best way that we could. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And for people listening, what is the difference between polyamory and non-monogamy? You go. You, okay. <laughs> I still don't really know. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> like I said, we'll be able to speak today from like personal experience. We don't represent the entire non-monogamous community or polyamory. Everyone's different, and that's like the probably the number one thing we can share is everyone's going to do relationships differently, whether you're monogamous or not, yeah. of course. So we, we totally recognize that. I'd say um, from what recent research I'm learning is polyamory is essentially, I used to believe it was, you know, dating multiple people at the same time. Now there's a lot of people who believe that polyamory is pretty much like an umbrella statement of anyone who identifies as non-monogamous. So non-monogamous um, non-monogamous and poly, I don't know, when we tell people we're open we're, or we're ethically non-monogamous or consensually non-monogamous, meaning, you know, we are each other's primary partners and our relationship always comes first or currently comes first and foremost. And then we do have the opportunity to date other people outside of the relationship. Um, poly, I guess, could look like that, but I believe mostly looks like maybe you have a wife and also a girlfriend or you have a husband and also a girlfriend or a boyfriend on the side. So it's, um, I think, uh, maybe pursuing more than one serious relationships at once. Yeah. I know. I think the identification of what we portray to other people is, I don't know, there's a stigma attached, I think, with polyamorous and and open relationships and like sometimes we don't date anyone or see anyone for almost a year don't we sometimes yeah. if we're just working on the inner stuff as individuals so yeah it's I think it's we do try to keep everything creative and not attach anything to it yeah don't we? open for us I guess we say Open's we're open probably. or yeah ethically yeah. non-monogamous okay. okay I hope that explains it yeah it does mm -hmm. I'm curious what does monogamy mean for you guys Monogamy means, well, I think of it as like a marriage thing. Once we're married, mm -hmm. we make a lifelong commitment mm -hmm. to each other, to be with each other for life no matter what. Mm -hmm. 
Um, no matter what brings good times, hard times, mm -hmm. I'm committed to her and she's mm -hmm. going to be my only partner sexually and that I connect with on that level mm -hmm. uh, for my whole life and or her whole life. Mm -hmm. And yeah. not even just sexually, but any kind of intimacy, totally, you know, mm -hmm. like deep intimacy. Yeah. Um, for us, our story, we've only ever been with each other. Mm -hmm. So it's a very interesting difference yeah. that we have between our, our couple's relationships totally. because most people are going through life was serial monogamy where they're mm -hmm. dating one person, maybe sleep with them and then date another person mm -hmm. separately, sleep with them. But we've only ever been with each other. We've been together for 20 years and we started dating when we were 15 and 16 years old and we waited until we were married to have sex. So we mm -hmm. dated for six years until we got married and now we have the rest of our lives to deepen our love through that way that we did it in the mm -hmm. beginning. So I think to get into all the things we want to touch on, what problems do you guys see with monogamy? I guess through my experiences with monogamy uh, and having children within monogamy, I just feel that I lost myself just in the upbringing of children. There was like so much focus on raising children without concentrating on the self and then communicating that with my partner, that individual evolution of self-awareness and all that that kind of evokes. For me, that was the reason that I didn't want to go down the same road as that's why we've gone non-monogamous because yeah because i think i lost myself and i know my partner at the time long-term partner she lost herself and then when the kids were not dependent on us anymore we kind of didn't know who we were and we didn't know who each other were and i think that's what we're very conscious of is to do individual things to keep the individual self evolving through connection that's Thanks my best way to explain it I think yeah and can you do you feel like you can only do that through sexual experiences with other people you can't do that in a monogamous relationship or was it something that maybe you guys didn't do that you could have done in a monogamous relationship I think if we had been aware of it we probably could have done it within monogamy but then you've got to not expect the other person to to meet you at some point maybe halfway of developing that self-awareness and wanting that growth for themselves to evolve through that growth. But I think we just were so, the, the children con consumed as so much of our time that we just didn't have the time to sort of take a step back and evaluate our own evolution. So that's like, I think that's really important. If, if monogamy is, is a choice, then it's good to be able to step away. And I don't think you necessarily have to have other deeper connections with anyone else. It's just, it's all about yourself evolving. But I guess for me, through my experiences, it's been more to diversify myself it, in reflection, in connection to other people. It's been beneficial to broaden that peripheral on, on connection just from past experiences having the same social group, just to diversify that, just so I could learn through experiences and, and real people and gain real knowledge. Let's see, I don't necessarily believe that, you know, there are all these inherent problems within monogamy. For me personally, and I've I've never really truly experienced long-term monogamy because mm. I'm still quite young and I met Matt when I was 24. So I'd only had really one or two serious relationships before then, which were both monogamous. I just don't believe monogamy should be the only social norm. I feel like for me, as I'm exploring this lifestyle and meeting other people who are a part of this community and this way of living, I just see the benefits so much so as much as I see that there are benefits in monogamy and non-monogamy. And um, yeah, I just think that it should be an option that's on the table and people are more aware of. And I don't know, I'd like to believe there's like a spectrum with monogamy. Actually, there's a Dr. Tammy Nelson who calls it the monogamy continuum. So it's like your monogamy, your version of monogamy may be on the farthest left point of the spectrum, which maybe you you guys may relate to of only us forever, only together. Maybe, you know, we don't talk to anyone else. We don't send messages to anyone else. We don't flirt with anyone else or whatever. That's our version of monogamy. And then there might be someone who, you know, it's the complete opposite of the spectrum. So I just believe that there's room for everyone somewhere along that spectrum. And then it shouldn't just be so black or white. You're either monogamous or you're poly and you're probably having sex with 100 people a year or something like that. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I mean, I have witnessed beautiful monogamous relationships and been, you know, part of them, families and myself in small ways. But, yeah, non-monogamy is just what I'm currently experiencing for the last five years. And it definitely feels rewarding enough and beneficial enough for me that um, I do feel like it's cool to be a little bit of an advocate just for this way of living and 
that it's an option, um, especially for women. I think it's mm-hmm. really cool to talk about. Especially for women. What do you mean by that? Oh, well, I think mostly like in society's eyes or in mainstream media or Hollywood, it's men are these big sexual beings with testosterone and they have this huge sexual appetite. And I think uh, women have it just as much as men and that, you know, often men are given more leniency when it comes to sex and cheating or infidelity or extra pair sex or, you know, whatever you want to call it. And um, yeah, I believe like based on female biology and just my personal preferences and who I am and um, the way that women have sex and the sexual appetites we have and the desires we have and um, our libidos, I just believe that there are more options for women who, yeah, want to have a strong a healthy relationship and a strong sexual like appetite and they want their needs to be met and I don't believe it's possible for everyone to have their needs met in monogamy so mm-hmm. okay You guys, if you aren't using non-toxic cleaning products in your home, it's time for an upgrade. Branch Basics is my new favorite line for a one-stop shop of all the cleaning needs for your family. Using products that are baby and family safe, free of fragrances, hormone disruptors, and harmful preservatives is a non-negotiable for me. And the fact that it's all plant-based and saves waste is an added bonus as well. Switching to non-toxic and fragrance-free cleaning products can relieve headaches, allergy, asthma symptoms, and also provide eczema relief. Their concentrate is used in different dilutions to create all the cleaning solutions then just refill the bottles when you're out it's simple and environmentally friendly one bottle of concentrate makes three all-purpose cleaners three bathroom cleaners three streak free cleaners three foaming hand washes and 64 loads of laundry along with being sustainable their products are hard working and range from cleaning the kitchen to toilets and even laundry and stain removal their starter kit includes all the bottles you need including the concentrate and oxygen boost setting you up for success for your new non-toxic cleaning routine so use my code ellen15 for 15 15% off all Branch Basic starter kits. You'll be so happy with the result and making the switch to non-toxic and sustainable cleaning products. They are amazing, you guys. You don't want to miss out on this deal. Well, my biggest concern would be raising children. Mm-hmm, totally. Obviously, divorce rates are high in both in all relationships, mm-hmm. whether it's uh, same sex or different sex or monogamous mm-hmm. or whatnot. But what I have read before that most open relationships end in divorce, marriages mm-hmm. end in divorce. So I think of the children. More than. More, more than not, monog- monogamous relationships, somewhere in the 50%, mm-hmm. whereas open marriages end in about 92%. Mm-hmm. So if children are involved, then it becomes a different, different, mm-hmm. different for me. So that'd be the main problem because generally speaking, when parents don't live together and the kids are being raised mm-hmm. by one parent or the parents are separated, it, generally outcomes for kids aren't as good. Mm-hmm. Kids do better when both parents are at home. Mm-hmm. So if you're going to purposely enter into a relationship that has a higher divorce rate mm-hmm. and a higher chance of you splitting up, then it doesn't seem like I'm, I like to look at risks. That's just the way my mm-hmm. brain looks, mm-hmm. works. I look at statistics and like, okay, well, if I'm more likely to get divorced, then mm-hmm. why would I do that when I want my goal is to be committed to her mm-hmm. and then obviously committed to my family mm-hmm. and raise the best kids we can. Mm-hmm. So that's really my only concern with mm-hmm. open relationships is if you have children, are you taking into account the, that you're maybe increasing your risk of, mm-hmm. of having of separating or the relationship not working out if it's two consenting adults with no kids and but it depends on what your goals right. are if your goal is if someone's in an open relationship or and they're in a relationship and they're considering opening it I would be why are you considering opening mm-hmm. it uh, and then if your goal is to stay together for life I my concern would be well you're doing something that is less likely statistically for you to stay together in the mm-hmm. life. But if your goal is just, let's see how it goes. We're just taking a day at a time. Mm-hmm. Then I just don't see any problem. With it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I guess that leads into the question of, is there a benefit to for life? Cause maybe for you guys, I don't know. You can tell us if, if your goal is to be together for life or not, or is it kind of, you know, if we don't end up together for life, that's okay. Every, every part of life has its seasons mm-hmm. and, you know, it's not necessarily a negative thing to go through. Mm-hmm. But for us, our commitment to life is like being together for life is it's similar. It's kind of like your your marriage vows, like a vow is something very sacred and meaningful and big. Mm-hmm. And the vow to be together for better or for worse, mm-hmm. that there's going to be hard times because everybody's messed up. You're never going to find someone that's just it's easy forever because there's no relationship like that where it's just always easy forever Mm -hmm. because we're all messed up. We're all inherently not perfect. Mm -hmm. So the for life commitment is, look, I'm going to stick with you even when you're not at your best. Like you'll stick with me when I'm not at my best. And the goal is 
having a growth mindset to always be growing and evolving together to be the best versions mm -hmm. of ourselves. And I think there's something to be said about having that stability in life with someone that is committed to you for life, mm -hmm. as opposed to if I'm not good enough, like you may bail, mm -hmm. you know, and we are interrelational beings. And so maybe you might argue that there's a benefit to having these extra relations, intimate relations mm -hmm. with multiple people. But for us, there's something so sacred and special about each other's bond together mm -hmm. that when things are hard and we're willing to grow from that, that's what like makes us stronger. Like our love is so much deeper now than it was even seven years into our relationship, which I couldn't have imagined or predicted because I thought seven years into our relationship that we would knew each other as best as we possibly could, but mm -hmm. that's just not the case. And actually when you go through hardships and come out of it, I feel so much deeper love for him than I did before. So I think maybe people's experiences of bad relationships, either with their parents or with themselves, you know, what is the underlying thing there? And I think often it could be if one or both are not willing to grow and evolve for the better, you know, and that makes it really hard, especially if you are willing to grow and evolve, but the other is not. So that's definitely difficult, you know, mm -hmm. but yeah, so that's where I'm at. Cool. That makes sense. What are your thoughts? Yeah, I think uh, that evolution process is, is so important and we focus definitely on unconditional love mm -hmm. and freedom as the foundation of our relationship. Like you, Amelia can't do any wrong. I'm there, whether the emotions of jealousy or insecurity within me are triggered at points and vice versa, we just get to sit there and we get to work through these emotions. And I guess at the start of our relationship, jealousy was <clears throat> one of those things that there was a reaction at times, even during our times of communication that somebody would react in a, not in a, not in a violent way or anything, but just in a just in that insecure way mm -hmm. but we've over time we've evolved to be able to watch our emotions and yeah I think that's just been such a beautiful thing to be able to have the experiences we have that which would break up a monogamous relationship mm -hmm. but just to sit back with unconditional love for somebody for an individual's experience and vice versa and and that to us seems to be the growth aspect mm -hmm. yeah well, I like the honesty part of it like it's great because a lot of monogamous relationships people are so worried like if they're having feelings for someone else mm -hmm. or tempted or do wind up doing something inappropriate there's so much fear that the, the relationship will be mm -hmm. over as a result then they hold it in and they lie and then the relationship deteriorates mm -hmm. because there's dishonesty, dishonesty in mm -hmm. it so i think that one of the main pros i don't know if that's if you would agree is the honesty factor yeah uh, obviously monogamy you can be honest too but totally. <laughs> yeah yeah yeah, we've, sometimes I have like an innate, maybe it's like an instinct to want to go on a date with somebody else and other friends that I have that are monogamous won't be as open as to speak about that to their partner. Mm -hmm. But then we've got friends that are open mm -hmm. and they'll say the same thing. So it's funny the conversations that you have with friends that are in monogamous relationships versus people in open relationships that will just blurt out anything that's sort of moving through you or feels like a something male instinct or and i'm sure females experience it too mm. just those things that sometimes you you keep under wraps within a monogamous relationship because you don't want to offend the other person but i think we're at the point now where we can just say and it's a beautiful thing to get to the point where we are where we can say whatever we're feeling i guess the instinctual mm -hmm. or we need to have a certain experience we mm -hmm. can just say that we want this experience and and then negotiate it or navigate it from 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 this point of unconditional love yeah yeah absolutely i mean i personally grew up my parents were divorced when i was two so i was raised by a single mom and then spent our weekends with a single dad basically so i never witnessed healthy communication between parents and I didn't really grow up much around healthy, mer you know, healthy communication between friends, parents, or anything like that. So, I'd say arguably, like our communication is better than many of the monogamous couples we know. And Probably, our, yes. Our honesty and trust with one another, and ability to communicate our emotions, our emotional awareness. Like we've put ourselves in so many testing positions and experiences where, like you said, we've had to come out on the other end, or we've chosen to come out together on the other end, and absolutely, we feel that 
deeper sense of love and connection and compassion for one another. And if anything, I feel like I've never known a partner this closely because there's none of that, none of the fluff to hide behind or none of the BS or the lies or, um, like you said that, you know, maybe you have a natural, you're attracted to someone else or just little things. I feel like because of this relationship container that, you know, we choose to be, and I really feel like I truly know you and I feel very seen and known and, and heard as well. And, I feel like my personal growth, you know, from when I started out in the relationship with Matt to thinking I'm going to be able to change you. I'm going to get the exact relationship I want. I know exactly what I want. And it's pretty much what everyone else wants. And, you know, I want to have the cookie cutter lifestyle and the husband that loves me and the children in the house. And I feel like I've been able to um, get to know myself so much more and what I actually truly desire in life and not just maybe the repetition of what I see in society or friends' wishes or desires. And yeah, I feel like our my communication, um, yeah, it feels like it's it's tripled my growth personally. And um, yeah, just learning everything basically from scratch again and then learning it, it feels like so much faster than many other people because we've, um, you know, we've allowed the opportunity for these challenging situations to mm-hmm. play a role in our, I don't want to say everyday lives, but in our lives, you know, as a non-monogamous couple. Yeah. Yeah. And as for what you said about children which was a little bit a while ago, but I obviously don't have any children yet, so I can't speak on it. But we talk about raising children together, of course, all the time, and it's something we'd love to do. And Matt already has two amazing children who are very familiar with our circumstance. And fortunately, they're incredible, and they have a great relationship with both of us. And I look forward to being able to have children and just teach them that you can love whoever you want and we're here to support you and you can love differently and we're, we're here to support you love differently. And if you want monogamy, we're here to support you. And if you don't, that's okay. And there's space for, like I said, there's that there's room for you anywhere on the scale and our love for you is unconditional and we're here to support you always. And um, there's actually a lot of research coming out now because it's obviously as time goes on, but long-term studies of children who were raised in completely non-monogamous families from the time of birth. So their entire adolescence were spent in non-monogamous homes. And I think the doctor, it's Elizabeth Sheff or Ellie Sheff as she goes by, but she's doing incredible studies right now, interviewing thousands of children. And pretty much across the board, you know, children are saying that they felt they had more um, adult role models in their lives growing up in non-monogamous families. They had more people to turn to for advice. And if they had their feelings hurt or they wanted someone to connect to, they had... Um, more adult supervision, which they obviously probably weren't thrilled about, but more adult supervision in the home. And then just the financial aspects of many non-monogamous families live together in one dwelling and the shared income, shared finances, shared expenses. So there's a bit more financial flexibility for the families and the children to be able to experience more and you know, be able to um, travel more and things like that. So there's some really interesting research coming out about it, but I I can't speak from personal. It sounds more like polygamy. polygamy It sounds more like polygamy polygamy. because if you have somebody in the home, multiple people in the home, that's a lot different than like, oh, I'm going to go on a date with a person and not be in a, like a serious relationship Mm -hmm. with them. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, I guess many long-term non-monogamous relationships or, you know, whatever you want to call they do choose to live together. It is quite common. So Mm -hmm. like, like polyamory. Polyamory. Yeah. Yeah. So So is that something you guys are open to? We always say we're open to anything. Yeah. We're always like, what's going to (laughs) happen? What's going to happen? What's going to happen? Yeah. We always, I think because we've moved sort of shifted away from the society, we live in a Eastern culture. We're vegan we've sort of shifted away from the society's constructs and we just want to sort of delay a a lot of them from Western society. And Mm -hmm. not that we want to move into the ideology of the East, but we'll take like little bits of the East, little (coughs) bits of the West, but then ultimately create our own wives Mm -hmm. that hopefully don't look like anybody else's. I think that's the ultimate goal (laughs) and be like, and be happy. And yeah, yeah, I mean, we can always shift things around and do different things things differently and if they don't resonate or they don't work out then Mm -hmm. we can change them back or change them a different way but I think that's the beauty of not living within that within what society has told Mm. us we've got to eat this we've got to relate like this I think Mm. creating something totally different and yeah we always talk about it be like do you want another (laughs) husband or do I so yeah we just we kind of muck around with with the way that we relate and as long as love and freedom is the fundamental foundation of our the way that we relate to one another and to the people around us with kindness and compassion and Mm -hmm. and and also the way we eat and consume food it's yeah life should be life should be cool 
So mm-hmm. I'm really, I'm, I'd be interested to see the study you're talking about. I'm skeptical of it because knowing that the higher, you're more likely to get divorced mm-hmm. if you're in an open relationship than even just monogamous, which mm-hmm. is already bad rates. Mm-hmm. I wonder like what the sample size was. And I'd just be really interested to look mm-hmm. at it after. Mm-hmm. So you can show me afterwards. Yeah, totally. And then there's two things picking on, piggybacking onto that. I really want to get into the topic of what is the point of sex? Like, is it sacred or is it just for, what is the point of it to you guys? Mm-hmm. Um, maybe we can go into that that as well. But the first thing before that, let's say you your relationship is open and you decide to have children and mm-hmm. you're just giving birth and you're in the postpartum phase. Mm-hmm. Would you keep that part open? I know you can't really say, oh, yes, this is exactly what we do because you're not there yet. Mm-hmm. But I just we know from experience how totally. vulnerable and sensitive that state is. Totally. And even with your example of what how you feel like your love is deepened and open. Mm-hmm. Can you imagine what that would be like if, you know, your part, this would be the, the moment when your partner would be, if the relationship was open, be like, peace, I'm going to go mm-hmm. sleep with someone else because, you know, you can't right now. Right. Like you're he recovering from birth right. and you have a newborn. And like, what are your thoughts on the vulnerability of that? Because to me, something that I find so manly and masculine is the protectedness of mm-hmm. The part of my husband, mm-hmm. you know, that he is there for me 100% and only me. And he, it's almost like, to me, it's a biological mm-hmm. experience of even, even the sacredness of birth, right? Like the problems we have in our medical birth system and other people handling birth, just the, the husband being there to help you with that baby born and the bond that you have from mm-hmm. this is our partnership. This is sacred. It's you and me, ride or die type thing. Totally. Versus if it was open, like you're not giving me what I want right now. I'm going to go sleep with someone else to fulfill my needs. It feels more selfish than it is selfless. Totally. So I think from your guys' perspective, it's more selfless to just let someone sleep sleep with who you want Mm because I can deal with my own triggers of jealousy or Mm -hmm. or whatnot. Mm -hmm. But is it possible it's actually the opposite, that it's more selfish to not be committed to that person Mm -hmm. and give to them? Because for us, I can't even imagine sleeping with someone else. I have zero desire Mm -hmm. to go sleep with anybody else, even if there's someone that I might find attractive there's no desire to, oh man, I really wish I could go sleep with that person right now. Mm -hmm. Or it would be great if we could go, you know, be intimate. Like it's the, the deep intimacy that I find from our, our commitment is part of what makes sex so great. Mm -hmm. But yeah, so I've touched on a lot of things, but what are your thoughts on that? Cool. I guess I'll answer the postpartum question. (laughs) Yeah. Um, no, uh, I think, like I said, we come first, our partnership. I always say like, I feel so fortunate with non-monogamy because I feel like I get to have my cake and eat it too. It's like I have the deep love and the support and the partnership and the intimacy and the stability and the security. And we would never do anything like that. Like that would be a hundred percent un unimaginable. You know, it's yeah, we, being sensitive. Yeah, absolutely. So that's not something no, we would we would never I mean, obviously you know, but no, we would never um even imagine the intention is never to hurt one another or like I said, we always consider one another first. So even before we go on a date or meet someone for a coffee or a tea or even, you know, initiate a conversation online, we'll communicate that with one another first and check in, how are you feeling about this? Or we always consider, you know, ourselves and our partner first. So of course, having children, you know, we talk about it all the time and the first 40 days and things like that, we have the shared vision of we want to be together. We want to start, continue a family and grow a family and compassion and sensitivity for one another is like at the foundation of our relationship so so if one person does have a problem with it then like what is the condition there is there that can is it unconditional like okay you're having a problem so I'm not gonna go or is it oh this is your problem that you're having a problem so you need to work on that hmm. in that circumstance yeah. of, um, or just any the circumstance you gave of we always check in with each other yeah. so if one person yeah. is having a problem what's the scenario there oh yeah if, if I say to Matt hey I got asked out on a date and I want to go and you know on Friday night are you cool with that and he says oh I actually was hoping we could have a night together or I was looking forward to spending time with you sure 100% mm-hmm. I'll cancel the date or I'll postpone it if you feel comfortable with that or yeah it's really um yeah I think you know we're, we are very considerate of each other's emotion sometimes I'll, I'll react personally and be like oh well, I thought we were gonna do this or You know, and then I'll think about it and I'm like, actually, we could do that the next night. And if he wants to do something, then I can, you know, I can actually get over it or allow it or, but no, it's oftentimes it's, um, right. It's just considering each other and yeah, prioritizing the the bond and the connection we have and making sure that our needs are being met as a, as as a unit together before we seek out externally for Yeah, probably if we, if I was to speak up and say, if I, if you were going on a date or something and Mm -hmm. It, it was 
I'd be like, make sure you ring me when you get there, make sure you message, but just so you know that just so I know Amelia is safe yeah. or in safe wherever she's going on a date, yeah. whether it's in public or whether it's it's someone else's house, that's all I need to know. And then, yeah, I, I don't think I would say, oh, I'm feeling really insecure or jealous, you shouldn't do this. It's more of a thing, go and enjoy yourself, express the love that's in with you, within you, mm-hmm. explore yourself, pleasure, everything, and but just, yeah, do it safely and make sure that you get to where you're going. So, do you have something to say or can I ask a question? Go ahead. So, to me, it sounds like sex is more transactional than it is, like, soul tying because, mm-hmm. like, what are, what are your thoughts on sex? Is it is it something that's, oh, it's it's like going and playing, it's like bowling with somebody. Mm-hmm. Like, you go out, you go out and you bowl and then you go back to your husband, you bowl with a friend, mm-hmm. or, you know, or is it is it a soul tie? Is it this sacred mon- mind, body, spirit experience if mm-hmm. it's with someone that you're lifelong committed to versus someone you just met a couple days ago mm-hmm. or a week ago or whatever? Mm-hmm. What do you feel like your sex can be as deep and intimate with someone you just met versus the person that you are so ride or die with, the person you're in love with, you've been through thick and thin with? Like, what do you think about that? Mm -hmm. Well, first, I feel like it's worth mentioning, like, we'll go on maybe, let's say we go on 100 dates. And out of those 100 dates, we're not probably even as much as kissing the first 70 people. Mm-hmm. Like we're not just out trying to sleep around and mm-hmm. get it where we can. It's right. absolute, like absolutely intentional. And um, yeah, of course we want to feel that connection before we explore in any intimacy or um, yeah, you want to feel safe. You want to feel attracted to them. You want the chemistry to align. Absolutely. And um, I do feel that we have found ways to almost like enhance and maybe sustain our incredible connection in sex life because I mean the reality for us at least the reality for me and maybe for you is and for many women and men I don't know if you guys have ever heard of the term limerence before it's like new relationship energy so yeah you have, yeah the yeah. chemistry the butterflies right that. so now there's studies saying that women usually experience like a tremendous decrease or decline in their limerence in the first two to three years of a monogamous long-term relationship and for men it's five to seven years so yeah we've been able to still you know have this incredible partnership have amazing sex have each other love each other be intimate and then also you know i've been able to be honest and say, oh, you know, I met someone out on the surf or I met a guy and there's a bit of a vibe and I might go grab dinner with him. And then maybe a few weeks later, I'm still hanging out with him and say to Matt, oh, I'm kind of interested in exploring what it could feel like to have an intimate connection with him. And um, no, it's not. It's not probably the same level of sex and um, connection, but it's still beautiful. And I think I always come back learning something about myself or about the situation that I can then bring home to my partnership with Matt and say, oh, you know, I was thinking about this and this came to mind and, or I really enjoyed it and it was great. And I kind of feel like I got this, like, I got it out of me and maybe I'll do it again or maybe I won't. But if anything, I'd say it comes home. I come home appreciating more the connection we have and the partnership and the chemistry and, um, yeah, that's why we, we don't really often ever do sleepovers because usually we just love sleeping with each other so much. And so we feel, we feel that same level of connection and, or maybe not the same, but we feel a version of that level of connection and deep, like intimacy with one another. And, and we probably, we attract different people as well. Like you attract a different kind of male and I guess I attract a different yeah. female and yeah, a lot of the people I connect to are deep into like tantric and Kundalini. And I think when you have sex with somebody that understands the Kundalini and the, the awakening and the evolving through that and the, the slowness and the, the way to, to, to more be your purer self without any of the constructs applied to the identity, you become this within Kundalini and within Tantric, you become this pure version. And, and I think through the evolution of our relationship, I'm attracting a lot of women that are wanting that same Kundalini Tantric uh, connection so and which is a beautiful thing i mean you, those teachings you can you can really get to know yourself and mm-hmm. get to really connect with other people as 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 we do as well so so yeah you want to chime in what do i think sex is <laughs> yeah what do you think uh, yeah yeah i view it as more of a, a sacred bond i mean i mm-hmm. my my belief system is just different like mm-hmm. i i believe i have more christian beliefs mm-hmm. so my belief is there's one de- mm-hmm. ultimate design for sex Mm -hmm. our creator designed us to be with one person for a reason Mm -hmm. uh sometimes 
you may like question those reasons. Mm -hmm. uh, but I feel like the main reason is to protect the family, to protect mm -hmm. the relationship, mm -hmm. and to deepen the bond with your partner. And I don't have any experience of being with someone else. Mm -hmm. So it's like we're coming at it from very different places. Like we've only been together, obviously. So it's really easy for me to just kind of see it like, well, this works great for us. Mm -hmm. Like it seems like a no brainer. It, you know, I, it, uh, it aligns with my belief system as well. Uh, but I can see how when you have different life experiences, you know, serial monogamy, mm -hmm. sleeping with multiple partners before you find the one person you want to marry, how it could be possibly more tempting or more desirable to want to sleep with other people mm -hmm. or be worried like, well, I don't want to be stuck with one person for the rest of my life mm -hmm. because you've had other experiences and you know there's different levels right. of quality. Right. Um, yeah, what if they're not as good at sex as the last person? That's something that I got asked a lot. Well, you're waiting until you're married. What if he's not good at sex? <laughs> like I got asked that all the time. Yeah. It's an interesting question to pose. I kind of look at it as this seeking the next thrill. Is mm -hmm. that always the best thing for your life mm -hmm. long term for other people, for society, for yourself? Mm -hmm. Because it makes me think a lot about porn and mm -hmm. how it has progressed to what it was from how long ago with Playboy magazines mm -hmm. to what it is now that has like abuse, you know, all kinds of mm -hmm. horrible implications of what happens in mm -hmm. the porn industry and porn, what porn looks like. And we've seen through studies that people who look at porn regularly, especially ha have more and more, it's always like, what's the next thing? Okay, mm -hmm. I'm bored of this. What's the next like extreme thing I can mm -hmm. get to. And so that's what it makes me think of with the serial monogamy that it's like, okay, what, but this isn't, I don't have the butterflies anymore. Like maybe I'm missing something. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's as, as opposed to looking to that really, to me, feels that deep, deep bond that you have when you're committed to one person. And it, it reminds me of Kim and Ami. I don't know if you know, mm -hmm. we talked about her and how she just talks about how, you know, when there's a, an issue within a relationship, mm -hmm. she's assuming a monogamous relationship that, you can't just like learn the right sex moves or learn that that's not what it is. Mm -hmm. It's a deep, deep, meaningful connection of like, am I seen? Am I supporting the other? Is the other supporting me? Selflessness, like total love for the other person where if your relationship is struggling, it's not that you're not going to have good sex together. Mm -hmm. But if you have, if you have um, an incredible relationship where you grow, evolve, listen to each other's needs, mm -hmm. also stay in yourself. I'm not saying drowning yourself to just support the other person, mm -hmm. but it's the oneness and the unity that can make sex so incredible. And there isn't this like, well, what else is out there? Because you don't, you don't, you haven't started down that road of the next thrill. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts on that? Mm -hmm. Do you want to share? Yeah, I think it all comes back to the individual to be able to enhance your own love. And I think, yeah, searching constantly externally for this happiness and this sex, like almost living a hedonistic reality or, or yeah, watching porn and, and, and trying to get this satisfaction constantly from other people and through porn and through all these things that we're we're conditioned to to think that, that they, these things make us happy it always allows you to revert back to your inner self and i think that's what that's what we've been very aware of is is if we are aren't feeling happy within ourselves no one else is going to give us happiness or pleasure so mm -hmm. i think we yeah we we concentrate on working out how to get this unconditional love for ourselves mm -hmm. and then I th I, then you can almost feel it boiling over and that's the point that's when we get to the point where right we're at a good point we're sharing it with each other we've got an overload and it's possible to share it with not only other people but we do a lot of animal rescue and we can like all that love is just expressed in so many different ways mm -hmm. not just sexually but it can be mm -hmm. there's no right or wrong i don't think mm -hmm. yeah i felt like for me like the one the one tipping point where i was like all right i can really wrap my mind around this is just more from like i guess it's a spiritual perspective you may say of just people come into our lives for a reason and i felt like i didn't want it i love matt i wanted to start creating our lives together i wanted to you know com commit to moving in together and building a home together and starting a family but also i didn't want to block off any other connection or possibility or friendship that may form or whatever and it's not so much as seeking it's more of like a, i have a total contentment and a bliss with where i am in my life and also i do believe that if i continue to stay open and you know um, believe in opportunity and miracles and things like that like the right people will come into my lives at the right time for a specific reason and i just want to make sure i'm always able to see them hear them be able to connect whether it's romantic or just totally platonic mm -hmm. so for me that was kind of the one thing and we always say like you know work towards happiness and i'll meet you there like really fill your own cup and we'll be there together so it's 
I don't like the word expectation, but it's, it's not me sitting here and saying, well, you need to meet my sexual needs, my romantic, my intellectual, my emotional. You need to be my best friend. You need to be the greatest in bed. You need to do all this. It's more, how can I serve myself? Enjoy having this amazing connection. And then if I do feel I need to find something else elsewhere, I'll just make a point to, you know, do that for myself, whether it's like I said, sexual or just be great to have a new friend or have a new guy friend or have a new conversation with someone who's interested in different things. So I don't even really know what the original question was. Uh, yeah, we were just going in all different directions. So, yeah. so I guess is your is your commitment to each other is it lifelong, or do you feel like it's you know it, it is what it is? If we end up parting ways, like what is the purpose then of your commitment? Yeah, okay. yeah. I'll say we we were married mm-hmm. and in our own sense of the word last year, and I love that you mentioned your wedding vows and this sacred testament to one another. We altered our our wedding vows <laughs> to um, yeah. I think we I guess personally I'll speak, but. Um, of course we love fantasizing about the idea of being together and, you know, raising more children together and being, being able to travel and experience lives together. And also, I guess I'm a little bit more of the reality is, I mean, I look at my parents' marriage, for example, and all my best friends' marriage, parents' marriages and divorce and separation happens. And that's a reality. And, um, of course it's not something that we want to happen, but I think we really just say like every day is a choice to, to, to choose to be together. And Yeah. I, I think I guess we are kind of more in the flow of like if we're meant to be together, if it feels amazing, if it's feeling great. And of course, there are hard times. And of course, you know, we experience that. But I would never want to um, bind you into something that, you know, in 10 or 15 years from now, I didn't feel yeah. re- rewarding for you or beneficial for you and, and vice versa, you know. But I guess I feel like if it's not rewarding or beneficial and you're in this place where it's like over. Mm-hmm what would be the reason, right? Mm -hmm. It seems to me like it's most likely, most common, this isn't going to be like all scenarios, but one or both are not willing to grow to the place where you're flourishing, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. What what could be the reason why you're like, I'm not into it? Is it because the lack of butterflies? You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Or is it because I'm just not liking the way this person is or Mm -hmm. anymore? I want to go with this person. This is why we see so many people who divorce and then get married and then divorce again. Mm Because, well, it's this person, it's this person, but there's no one person that's just going to, if you to think it's just going to be amazing always forever and if they're not amazing I'm out mm-hmm. because I think there is something to say about the stability of knowing that you're going to be there for mm-hmm. me and that I'm going to be there for you when times are tough mm-hmm. you know because without that stability it's like it's just, just I feel like see what you feel like in 20 30 years and like I don't know if that's going to bring happiness mm-hmm. and I don't know but I think for us it's not the dependence on somebody else and it's not having that person there I think it's just having yourself there. Like I think that's the work that we've been doing is just to be, just to realize that you are capable of everything. You don't need another person. Mm. And I think that's what, <clears throat> I think that's what is our relationships blossomed under those, that sort of process, isn't it? It's like the individual mm-hmm. has everything it needs. It doesn't really need to count. It doesn't really need to be held accountable by mm-hmm. someone else. But yeah, there's like some sort of, I don't know what, what how you would say it. Mm-hmm. Can I ask yeah. you, you guys, mm-hmm. um, <clears throat> is divorce ever an option for you two? Is this something you speak about? No. That's, no. no. Never an option? Never. Yeah. It's so not an option. even if you hypothetically found yourselves unhappy in the relationship or both of you. Well, there has been times when we were unhappy mm-hmm. in the relationship, but you have a choice to how we move through that. And that's why I was saying it's really a commitment between two people to being willing to grow mm-hmm. because when one person is unwilling mm-hmm. to – humble themselves and Mm -hmm. see where they are where there are faults within their own Mm -hmm. being and figure out what they need to do to create a more flourishing relationship that's Mm -hmm. where that's where people get stuck you Mm -hmm. know like oh well this person was this way or let's say there's someone in an abusive relationship so this whole never if I was being physically abused or sexually abused or any kind of abuse that's different but to me it comes down to being willing to grow so the times when we have had really intense struggles Mm -hmm. you don't just stay there so mm-hmm. you, you have to grow and be mm-hmm. humble yourself to grow from it. And then we come out the other side mm-hmm. and are more deeper in love than ever before. Mm-hmm. And it's that love that the way that we treat each other mm-hmm. that creates that. It, it's like this this um, understanding of the love bank mm-hmm. that every relationship, every person has a love bank Mm -hmm. and it's from this book called his needs her needs which is a little bit you know there's things i don't love about it Mm -hmm. it's super conservative the way it's worded in other in things but the concept is super amazing and i'm sure a lot of people everybody knows the five love languages Mm -hmm. but this is about 10 basic emotional needs Mm -hmm. and however everybody has certain things that 
are higher needs than others and Mm -hmm. they're different. And so with your love bank, your partner or any relationship, sister, mother, friend, they're either adding a love coin to the bank or taking it out through Mm -hmm. every interaction Mm -hmm. and every experience, mother to child, everything. And if you take too many coins out of the bank, that love is depleted and you don't feel that love for that person Mm -hmm. anymore. So the purpose of the, the, the drive behind how are we going to keep this relationship is incredible and stable and loving and deep and meaningful, which actually makes your sex better, mm-hmm. is adding love boi- coins to each other's bank. Mm-hmm. So that's that's kind of mm-hmm. – was that – what was your question? Yeah. If divorce oh, divorce. Yes. yes. Why don't you go? Yeah. I mean, even if you weren't willing to grow, it still wouldn't be an option for me personally because mm-hmm. I have deeper convictions than just my, my own. Right. You know, I have spiritual convictions right. that even if you weren't – committed to the relationship i would still be committed to you Mm -hmm. Uh, i would too did i say that we weren't no no, i'm not (laughs) putting words in your mouth i'm just saying like but obviously if it's going to be a healthy marriage Mm -hmm. like both sides have to be committed to grow and if one side's not then obviously it's going to be very very difficult Mm -hmm. and unhappy and it's Mm -hmm. going to not going to be good for the kids either Mm -hmm. like one of my main concerns was like open relationships end in divorce more. It's mm-hmm. not good for the kids, but in monogamous relationships, obviously they end in divorce too. Sometimes they stay together even when they're struggling. That's mm-hmm. not good for kids mm-hmm. to see their parents going at mm-hmm. each other's throats either. And one but, of the reasons why, oh, sorry, keep going. Oh, let's go ahead. One of the reasons why you're saying, oh, um, that they're uh, about divorce and why people are unhappy is I feel like there's so, there's a lot of selfishness mm-hmm. in relationships that can mm-hmm. happen and one of the mm-hmm. things that's beautiful about you guys are so conscious of this not being selfish and selfish and mm-hmm. I think that's beautiful um, but in relationships it can often be and it could even happen in non-monogamous mm-hmm. of what are you doing for me you're not doing this you're not being this way you're not instead of looking within themselves totally. you're like where can I grow where can I change mm-hmm. and that that's what makes a relationship more flourishing more flourishing is humbling yourself Instead of pointing the finger at the other, it's what an, what can I do to shift the way that I am being? Mm-hmm. What can I do to grow and be better? So mm-hmm. that's what has gotten us out of those hard times. Mm-hmm. And I'm sure there's plenty more yeah, to I mean, that could apply to any relationship. Any relationship. Yeah, obviously, yeah, yeah. that's something we agree on 100%. Yeah, and so I think because we both kind of agree with that, mm-hmm. right? Would you say you agree with the selflessness aspect? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. That it really comes down to sex that is it is it what is the purpose of sex because mm-hmm. this is the main the main difference right because mm-hmm. for you you're saying it, it could be just a date mm-hmm. where it's flirty mm-hmm. but it's a sexual chemistry right it's intimate sexual chemistry or is it not no i would say I, yeah i would argue it doesn't come down to sex for us i think it's more of just this knowing that and it probably does answer the previous question as well of like you're free to always honor your needs and honor your desires whether that be hey i really feel i need to go on a backpacking trip by myself or whatever I, you know i want to learn a new language or i think i want to live in india for a month or whatever it may be so i think for us it's a, it's a bigger picture of um yeah not so much just I, we want to have sex with other people or whatever um but more just hey, we want this to work. We want to continue to enjoy this long term, hopefully, if it feels like the best thing to do. And what do we need to do as individuals to make sure that we're both in a place where um, we're able to show up as the best versions, most fulfilled, happiest, wholesome versions of ourselves to be in an enjoyable relationship with one another? Yeah, but like backpacking across the world, choosing to do that, Mm -hmm. that doesn't make it non-monogamous. Totally. Right? So the non, isn't it more actually about the intimacy when you break it down of like what exactly makes it non-monogamous? or film, yeah, Yeah. forming um, like emotional or romantic connections with other people. Yeah, Yeah. definitely. So do you feel like going back to that next thrill thing when you're going on other dates Mm -hmm. and then you say, oh, let's try a threesome, let's do a foursome, let's do... Mm -hmm. At the the idea of like the rules and the boundaries, you got to make sure it's all this right, stuff with the right. three sums up. Because I was watching your video, right. I loved <laughs> watching you guys talk and hearing your perspective on that. Um, it's it sounds very transactional, like mm-hmm. it's just it's it. I feel like the word, the idea, the words on paper of the beauty of non monogamy, it sounds nice, mm-hmm. but when it actually comes down to actually doing it, it's very just. To me, it sounds like, and I want to understand you guys, mm-hmm. but it sounds like transactional sex. Mm-hmm. Okay, after you have sex, do we decide if the person leaves? Do they sleep in our bed? Do they sleep in another bed? Or do mm-hmm. they have to leave? And so it's just the experience of sex. And mm-hmm. so I guess the the larger question of like, is this good for society? Is this good for kids? Like you mm-hmm. mentioned, is this good for ourselves? Mm-hmm. And going back to the, well, I need to feel, fulfill my needs, like trusting each other to fulfill our needs and not having the attachment. It sounds really nice, but is... I guess another philosophical question is like, should we always act on our impulses? Mm-hmm. Is that always good? Mm-hmm. 
I think for me, every time we have an experience outside of the, I guess, the societal norm, the next day there is a delaying process. And I think when we have connections with other people, the playfulness is is probably the right word to use. But then we are in we are invoking that deeper sense of unconditional love for whoever's interacting. But the next, for me anyway, the next day is the construct of what society's expectations of us as humans, as Westerners, mm-hmm. dissipates, which which the integration process is like two or three days it takes. Like sometimes we will like communicate it, sometimes we need to spend time by ourselves. But when we do things that are away from the society and we do things on our own accord and create new things and new sexual experiences, there is a dissolving of construct constructs that have been placed on us to kind of suppress our expression sexually so those things that are put on us from birth i guess slowly edge away just slowly come away and we're kind of a little bit more freer but then you do have to be able to integrate that process of Mm. of how you've experienced sex with with other people can i ask you guys met when you were 15 and 16 yeah when how old were you when you were married 21 21 22 22 22. Mm -hmm. was i 22 you were 21. 21. 21. So would you say at that age, and obviously, you know, people get married at all ages, but you two were fully confident making the choice that this is it. I'll never be with anyone else. I'll never, I'll never crave a sexual or whatever explorative. I'll never want to be curious about exploring sex with a woman or with a male or anything like that. You both were confident in making that choice at 21 and 22. Yeah, I, was, yeah. I was extremely mm-hmm. confident. Yeah. And very confident and you were the only person I want to spend the rest of my mm-hmm. life with. That mm-hmm. was definitely, yeah. couldn't wait, could, just so excited yeah. to have that commitment of it's you and me, there's nobody else right. that I want right. to yeah. be with. That's beautiful. But yeah. maybe you want to expand more. I mean, I had a different set of beliefs then. I mean, I called myself Christian, but I wasn't I wasn't a practicing mm-hmm. Christian, but I kind of just had this belief of like, oh yeah, this is what I do. And part of that's my upbringing. Mm-hmm. Like I grew up in a Christian home. Mm-hmm. I had parents that had been married for 40 plus years. I only know successful marriages. I, most of my friends' uh, parents had good good marriages mm-hmm. or at least were together. So that was my view of marriage in the world. Mm-hmm. Uh, I knew of divorces, like a lot of my aunts and uncles had been mm-hmm. divorced. But So that was just, that's, that's how you're supposed to do it. Like, mm-hmm. why would you do it any other way? It wasn't necessarily, mm-hmm. I don't know how much of it was like a personal conviction. I just felt like that's what I do. Of course right. I commit to you. I love you. Why would I want to be with anybody else? Mm-hmm. I don't know if I fully wrap my head around it. I mm-hmm. mean, uh, but as we've been married, it's just been more solidified. It's mm-hmm. like obviously I'm going to do this, and I'm even more confident probably than I was then because mm-hmm. it's hard to fully know at 21 or 22 right, right. what it's going to feel like in 10 years or where you're going to be at. But we're right. complete. We're very different people than we were when we got married. Mm-hmm. Like I'm even a much when we person. just met. We are completely different Mm -hmm. people than when we just met. That's why I think so many young people don't end up staying together Mm -hmm. because you're changing. Your your brain is not fully developed, and most people grow apart from each Mm -hmm. other. But we happened to grow. I don't know if it happened or if it wasn't, you know, what's the reason behind Mm -hmm. it, but we grew together where Mm -hmm. I took on more of his admirable qualities and he took on more of my admirable Mm -hmm. qualities, and we were able to shed away the things that were not as, as... admirable quality Mm -hmm. qualities that were our best selves Mm -hmm. and so we evolved and grew together Mm -hmm. but it's it's amazing how different we are at 15 and 16 Mm -hmm. I mean everybody is completely different at at that point so I mean I think back to those days when we were super young and I am so glad that I was not having sex at 16 17 18 19 I was not emotionally um ready for that Mm -hmm. and once we got married, it was like, yeah, now we got the rest of our lives to explore and learn and grow. And our sex life at, you know, the first times being together versus now is a million times better. Like I can't even, when you look back to like our first time, just, you know, kids just figuring it out. Mm -hmm. But, but the difference is that there was just a complete safety and security Mm -hmm. of knowing, like knowing the person. Cause I think when you don't know someone, I mean, I don't have personal experience with mm-hmm. it, but just from friends who have had sex with people that they don't really know mm-hmm. that there's a lot more insecurity, a lot more just lack of safety mm-hmm. with not knowing this person, something that's so intimate. Mm-hmm. And to me, like life soul type bonding mm-hmm. and having that complete love for each other that I mean, you guys have love for each other, of so course. that's not like, a, of course, not of course. trying to compare that, but that 
I just felt completely safe and mm-hmm. seen with mm-hmm. that person. So we grew together with that. Mm-hmm. And I mean, our sex life has evolved to be so much better than it was even when we first got married. And that's so beautiful mm-hmm. that it isn't just like, a oh, are you good at sex or are you not? It's that we both learned how to be, how to please each other and how to make it a selfless, like life altering, like bed shaking experience, mm-hmm. you know, whereas a lot of times you hear it's just like portrayed in the media that, oh, if you're married for such a long time, then sex is going to be blood and like mm-hmm. you, you better go see other people. And my personal, our personal experience is everyone we know who has been married monogamous and chose to open the relationship that it was like a last resort thing like Mm -hmm. oh maybe this is what we need and then it just fell apart Mm -hmm. and for the kids was not obviously it's not something good for kids it's something that we see in all kinds of studies that children who grow up in a single income or single home versus two parents Mm -hmm. um dramatic differences in their childhood and the outcomes of their life you know Mm -hmm. being graduating high school less likely to um, go to prison, all kinds of different mm-hmm. things. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, yeah, that's my thoughts. What do you think? Yeah, oh, I think they're great. Thank you for sharing. <laughs> I love you guys, by the way. I love <laughs> hearing what you're sharing, and I think it's so fascinating and interesting to hear com- to ha- hear us both with like, completely different ideas, but still there's so much love involved in your choices. You know, cl- it's clear. Thank you for sharing more of your experience being married so young. And respectfully, I think I struggle to maybe not agree, but I struggle to understand how one could make such a long lasting decision at such a young age. You know, like even I have, you know, I see on social media now more and more people getting married, 19, 20, 18, 21 or whatever. And I mean, I know when I met Matt, I was 24 and there was no way I was willing to give anyone a a, a solid answer of, I only want to do this for the rest of my life, just because there was so much I hadn't yet experienced that I was mm-hmm. still curious about. So yeah, what are your thoughts on on that? Or well, I think a lot of it has to do with culture mm-hmm. and then your own experiences. Like I had mentioned, like my view of marriage was different than right. yours growing Definitely. up in a great, you know, mom and dad situation. And then culture, obviously, like Our grandparents, it was very, very common to get married right after high school. I think my mom said that like half of her friends after they graduated high school got married. Right. And the success rate of those marriages, they stayed married longer. I don't know if their relationships were necessarily better. Right. Divorce rates have only gone up as we've delayed marriage. Right. I don't necessarily have an answer for why. I just think a lot of that is cultural and then your experiences growing up as mm-hmm. divorce has become more and more normal. Younger people are seeing that and being like, huh. Because the average age of getting married now, even though there are people that get married young, like you see people get married young, right. the average age of getting married is much higher than it was in the previous mm-hmm. generation or even the previous generation. Mm-hmm. So I feel like if anything, it's moving towards people losing trust in the mm-hmm. system mm-hmm. because they're seeing so many people are growing up in broken homes. Right. And so it's right. like, why would I want to do that? So I get why, why people would want to explore. But for us, it just, it seemed like a no brainer. Mm-hmm. Both me. of us. It's really interesting. We were yeah. talking about this last night, how both of us grew up in a household where both of our parents are still together. Mm-hmm. And both of your parents did not stay together. Yeah. It's such an interesting, Absolutely. our experiences totally shape how we view the world. Totally. And it seems to me like we are more likely now, we're getting more aware of how to grow and evolve as a person. Mm. You know, it might have been through our grandparents' generation of like, just stay together and it doesn't matter what the what the outcome or how the marriage is. You just don't get divorced because that's like a shame in society, right? right? But now it seems like we're a lot more understanding of like the mind-body connection of your experiences and how they shape your traumas and how you view the world and Mm -hmm. being able to heal from those traumas. There's a lot of different more modalities now on how to heal from your traumas and tap into your emotions, I feel like, from Mm -hmm. what it was a couple generations ago. Mm -hmm. But that's just my what I'm looking at. I don't know know Mm -hmm. what you think about that. Uh, It relates back to that kind of the monogamy continuum that I talked about. It's like it's perfect for you two because you both have the same values, the same ideas of – Uh, monogamy excuse me and partnership and um yeah i think for a lot of people in order to find a partner that makes you feel like your needs are being met you're fulfilled and you're in this happy relationship they need to be in a very similar space than you than you do you know and and i argue as i'm a little bit younger than you know than you guys and i have probably a, a bit more of a progressive friend group now because of the lifestyle i live but i just see so many people continue to explore and then they learn totally new things about themselves or oh my god i can't believe it but i'm actually interested in women now i think or whatever so um, yeah, I don't know. I guess I've just believed that the more room for experimentation and exploration is maybe better results in like self, um, awareness and, um, more, yeah, like knowledge and 
confidence in who you are and what you want. And I think a lot of people don't realize like in order to have that incredible partnership where both people are on the same terms, you really do need to find someone who's on the same place in that spectrum as you. And I wasn't really able to identify where I was on that spectrum at the time that I met Matt. So I think we had, there was room for discussion and room for flexibility in the future of, hey, if you decide you want something totally different than I do, you don't need to decide right now. We're just going to continue to feel into this and, you know, see see what develops and you know even personally like I knew when I met Matt I'd never been with a woman before I thought maybe one day I'll want to experiment or explore with that I, I don't know and you know I vocalized that to him and he was like cool maybe I'll want to have you know group experiences in the future or whatever so we kind of just left room open for those circumstances and now I guess I am probably biased but I struggle to you know believe that an 18 year old or a 21 year old or a 24 year old can say yep this is exactly what I want for the next 60 years of my life even though it's probably a reality for many people it's mm -hmm. just a personal well personal I think opinion. it's definitely like you said having the same beliefs like similar belief system mm -hmm. about what is the purpose of our relationship mm -hmm. and also the fact that we had been together for so long yeah. was one reason why so, definitely. we felt so confident definitely. it wasn't but then again, there's a lot of people who get married after one year and they also feel confident in the moment, yeah. but maybe later they're like, oh, right. shoot, I didn't know this about this person. Right, right, definitely. But it's the, it's what, what is the goal basically it comes mm -hmm. down to? It's the growing together, being committed to each other. Mm -hmm. And like you said, like for us raising healthy children. Yeah, I guess basically that's what mm -hmm. it comes down to. Yeah. Well, children, and that's a good thing to bring up too, because like, obviously children are very important, but like our relationship has to be the most important in, in order to have, in order to be able to stay together for our kids right. and be good parents, our relationship has to be good. Mm -hmm. So one advice that I would give to couples that are having children is like, make sure you focus on your relationship yeah. with your spouse more than your kids. Totally. If, it, if your kids come first, you're gonna you're gonna struggle. Mm -hmm. Those kids are really hard, mm -hmm. and and <laughs> they, they see it. Face. They feel it when you're not doing well. So that's one reason why you guys might have this view of like, look, if it's not, they're not doing well. Like I'm not doing well. It was better that they got divorced. You know, there's mm -hmm. a, there are people who mm -hmm. say that mm -hmm. that they felt better that their parents got divorced. Yeah. I definitely feel that way. <laughs> I don't know about, and I'm sure you do as well. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, I mean, I was really young, but even just seeing the relationship they had after the divorce, I was thinking, thank God I didn't live in that household with those people for much longer than I did together yeah. in that in that way. But similar to you, I grew up in like a really, um, I wouldn't say strict, but a very Catholic religious home. And mm -hmm. um, divorce was not an option for my parents as well. And even when my parents went to the church, the church didn't allow it. And they had to go to marital therapy with the priest before it was even something that was an option for them. And yeah, it was a it was a big a big decision for them, and um, I do feel grateful that it you know it did result in the way it did. Um, I believe they're both happier outside of the marriage, and although I can't speak for children that grew up in homes with two parents, there I, I do have a beautiful relationship with both my parents. Yeah. So I'm so lucky that that's the case. And you grew up. Um, Matt's parents were divorced later in life at 18, so he had a really different experience than I did. Yeah, yeah, my parents I guess weren't compatible from the start. I would say. They were just two different people wanting two different things from life, but I guess they try to make it work and they got to the point where it wasn't going to work and, yeah, they divorced, but I don't know. I don't know <laughs> so, no, that's good. I guess just going back to that question of, like, what is the purpose of sex? I feel like we kind of keep going around mm -hmm. it. We're kind of answering, but what what do you think the purpose of it is? I think it's to awaken consciousness for me. Only discovering that I guess it maybe when I was 47 just something clicked I think it was between us no I know it's between us um this feeling of like ex something expanded within me mm -hmm. and it brought us both in it brought me closer to Amelia and I hadn't experienced that and I I guess I've had a lot of sex but that one point was like it was something transformative it was like the mind it just something went beyond my physical body and I, as I was lying there and I couldn't move for maybe 30 minutes, that's the day we had the earthquake, remember? Mm. There was an earthquake <laughs> like five minutes after that and we like hurried up when we were at Padang. Okay. You're like, what's this life-changing sex? I don't remember. It was, <laughs> I do remember the sex, but I don't remember I, it, But it was for me. It probably wasn't. I think it was an individual thing for me. It was like this thing that exploded within me. And I've had it, I've had it since, but that was the first time I'd ever experienced mm. this kind of awakening it was just like beyond just pleasure it was like this expansion of something within me mm -hmm. which they can which they say could be kundalini activation mm -hmm. or, or maybe it was our breathing technique and it 
there was DMT exposed or whatever. Who knows? <laughs> but yeah, I think that was that was probably off the top of my head. That experience of sex that time mm-hmm. when we were at Padang was mm-hmm. yeah was another level that. I'd never experienced before. Thank you. <laughs> so then how, is that not good enough, staying with just her? What is it that makes you need more and somebody else? And I, I think, Andrew, know. you guys would be good to talk together about that, mm. that idea of, you know, when you see another woman that's attractive, like mm. what is the point? Where, what are your philosophies on that? But you go ahead first. I think it's, it goes beyond sex. There's something when you meet somebody else, whether they're like if we go on a date and – majority of the time it's we're just meeting up and having a conversation and then we'll either go our separate ways or have another date very rarely will it constantly be an experience of something sexual Mm -hmm. but there is something there is some sort of chemistry when you meet someone new or different that there's this familiar there's this familiarity with within that connection and then the intellectual connection comes in and there's a little bit of an emotional and then I feel like there is a sp- there is something spiritual that we can have with more than one person that we can connect, and then once you've grasped those connections, then the sex is almost just on top of that. You've already established something spiritual between this person. Maybe they've come to teach you something about yourself that your part- current partner can't. And I think we've both experienced just meeting different people and going, oh, "I never thought of life that way. I'm more aware of this now." So, like, I think people are drawn to us to kind of broaden our peripheral on awareness and awareness of like our emotions and, you know, different parts of ourselves that we've been unaware of or we haven't reaffirmed. Um, And then sex is, I think once you've established that within the intellectual and the spiritual and the emotional connection with somebody, then the sex is, sex is usually just the icing and the sex is usually good if those other connections are, I guess, jointly, yeah, just, yeah. (laughs) <laughs> I don't know the word. What do you say? I'm really interested. Reciprocated. Like, reciprocated. Yeah. I've been really interested recently in learning more about like female biology. And there's a book by Dr. Wednesday Martin called Untrue, which is incredible. I recommend it to anyone who's messages me or is interested in learning more about um, non-monogamy. But she is like been researching for years and it's a wide array of things that, you know, she speaks about in the book from We share 98.7% of our genetic material with bonobo monkeys who are Mm. notoriously, you know, not monogamous in their natural environment, excuse me. And um, women, you know, there's a lot of, I don't want to say proof, but there's a lot of research coming out that, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Encourage, no, that, oh my gosh, illuminates or whatever the fact that women might be, might benefit more from multi, you know, sexual, multiple sexual partners from, Women, for example, the average woman, it takes 20 minutes for the average woman to have an orgasm. 20 minutes, yes. And then for a man, it takes 2.5 to 5 minutes on average for a man to come to ejaculation. So if a woman's taking 20 minutes and a man's taking on average 2.5 to 5 minutes, what happens there? What happens when it's been two and a half, three minutes and the man's already orgasmed and he has a long um, refractory period, it's called, of when he's able to perform sexually again. And I think it's on average 12 to 24 hours for most men before they can have sex again. So what happens there for the woman who hasn't yet reached climax and is maybe laying in bed for another 18 or 17 minutes without, you know, um, without reaching climax? And um, yeah, just from like the clitoris alone, like our biology and how the clitoris is a huge gland as large as men's, you know, um, genitalia and their glands and uh, the nerve endings on the clitoris alone and just that men's spermicide, men's sperm, excuse me, contains spermicide at the um, final remnants of their ejaculation. It contains spermicide that potentially would have been used to kill off any other sperm from another man that might have been in the woman's body previously to having sex. So I think um, the more research I'm doing about female biology and just some of these studies that are coming out, I I do believe that maybe um, some or most women are meant to have benefit from the pleasure of having multiple sexual partners because we're able to just experience more pleasure. And what I talked about with limerence and the sex drive, you know, depleting for me, it's just been more of like, all right, I can read this research and I can also know monogamy and what it's like, but I do have sexual desires and I do meet someone else or come across another man or have form a friendship. And I do feel that sexual energy and that um, sexual chemistry building. So for me, it's just a, been a choice of, do I want to pursue it and follow it or do I not want to? And I guess I've chosen the path of wanting to pursue it and follow it in my own way. So I don't feel that sex is transactional. I can understand totally how you may think that. Um, 
but I don't know. It almost feels like it's hard to comment because everyone's sex is so different. We can't pretend to know what other people's sex and their connection is like. We know what ours is like and no one else knows what ours is like. And um, for us, we've just found that exploring sexuality in these different ways personally and together has led to what we feel is a healthier and more exciting sex life, you know, for us because we do have the permission and the space to explore more and explore together, um, which, you know, a lot of people in monogamy aren't, aren't, don't choose to do. So I just not answer the question. Well, I just want to respond to what you said okay. about, um, about this research coming out that you're feeling like maybe women would benefit from mm -hmm. multiple mm -hmm. um, relationships. I would actually kind of argue the opposite. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to um, men taking 2.5 minutes, what I would argue is that men need to last longer. And that's mm -hmm. something, mm -hmm. this this idea that, oh, men, yeah, two, four, five minutes, just get it in. Totally. That's not going to pleasure the woman because right. women, like you said, take longer. It's like the whole men are a microwave, women are a stove, and right. it takes longer. Um, and a deep, meaningful sex would be to mm -hmm. spend your time warming up, loving on that person in all the ways and men working on lasting longer. Mm -hmm. So. I mean, our sex is definitely not 2.5 minutes. I would, you know, the Kim and Nami way is like three hour sex date and men, it is on you to step up and last longer. Right. So what you're proposing is idea that men only last 2.5 mm -hmm. minutes. So what do you do when you're laying there for 72 or more minutes? Mm -hmm. Are you suggesting that, oh, just let another guy come in and mm -hmm. insert in? That to me is not the answer. The answer mm -hmm. is men work on lasting longer mm -hmm. to please your woman and you guys, you please each other that way for longer, more intimate, deeper mm -hmm. sex. And I think the idea of women needing or maybe being designed to have more partners, um, I would focus more on childbearing and mm -hmm. how it is more likely that the design of us having a baby to take care of mm -hmm. shows us that we need one partner to stick with us mm -hmm. through thick and through thin to protect and, and help and raise and be that strong masculine, like I'm with you to protect you in all things. Mm -hmm. Um, that shows us that we need that one person because mm -hmm. if you have multiple, you're more likely for STDs and more likely to have unplanned pregnancies. That's just the reality. If you're not having sex and waiting until you're married and you're only with that one person, mm -hmm. there's no way that you're going to have sex with someone that you weren't planning, mm -hmm. that you aren't willing to have a baby with mm -hmm. or to get pregnant. Um, so there's that. I feel like to me, the biology is really clear that we are we are, if you're going to look at biology, right. that we right. are actually designed to need one man stay with me because I might have a baby. If I get pregnant, you're there to right. protect me and help me and be there right. with me. Um, and if you're saying, well, save sex and all that, none of that is part of nature. You know, the condoms and totally. birth control, all this stuff, that completely disrupts nature. So right. we're really talking about nature. Right. The nature would be just having sex with no protection. And right. so that would be clearly one person because if you're pregnant with a baby that's not the man's baby right and they're like i'm gonna go with someone else who doesn't have another baby right. because then i don't have to take care of that baby do you know what i'm saying yeah. so that's why to me it feels really clear that specifically women are right we need one person right but to argue that if i may yeah go go back <laughs> some of the some of the research is you know these bonobos specifically is what i'm learning most about so if, if you care to relate at all or if that's your thing or not but it's showing quite the opposite of the more male monkeys that female monkeys are having sex with the more protection the longer the child's um it, more likely to live because there are more men who think oh it might be my baby so i should stick around to be able to pr provide food support protection there's actually um studies coming out that a male monkey will never kill ever no matter what type of aggression or acts of violence they're in or tribal fighting or whatever it may be a male monkey will never kill the offspring of a monkey that he's had sex with before because there's some slight chance that it could be his own offspring so in the in the jungle in the wild yeah. you know it's it talks a lot about protection food security um, nourishment you know for the, both the mother and the child mm -hmm. so it's interesting to consider both sides. Yeah. And but I do think that animal studies are, no matter how close our DNA are, is not comparison to human the studies. we live in, totally. Because we yeah. are different. And even though yeah. there's close, you know, DNA, it's still drastic. Like, we have so much DNA. Of so, course. like, you know, monkeys lick their own butts, too. We're yeah. not going to do that, you yeah. know. So just that aspect of a human study of what that's right. like and what we see at society at large when, oh, with a woman having a baby that's not right. their own and what the implications are right. of that. And you could argue culture, totally. totally. But um, I think like a human study would be a lot more valid. Yeah, yeah um, one of my questions, or in the beginning we were saying my concerns, one mm -hmm. of my, it's more of a question and a concern, but like multiple partners, there's more of a chance for unplanned pregnancies. Mm -hmm. Multiple partners, there's more of a chance for STDs. Mm -hmm. And for society, 
as a whole, do you think society would be better off? I, I personally think, like, if everyone just had one sexual partner, obviously we wouldn't have the need probably for to discuss even abortions. There would mm -hmm. rarely ever be them because mm -hmm. every pregnancy would be within the construct of a marriage or one partner. There wouldn't mm -hmm. be STDs. There wouldn't have been all these out, the AIDS outbreak that mm -hmm. caused so many deaths. I don't know if that was specifically yeah. related to that, but it going it kind of goes against our biology when we're start we're creating new STDs or having all these unplanned pregnancies, mm -hmm. whereas if you don't have multiple partners, that's not a risk. Mm -hmm. it's, the risk is literally zero. Mm -hmm. And the only way you can really prevent pregnancy, I mean, there's other ways. The surefire way to prevent pregnancy is obviously not have sex. And right. then the next is put on a condom or take a medication, which right. is not natural like you had if we're mentioned. going back if we're going if we're, if we're having the discussion about biology right. and he's right that the amount the percentage of abor abortions with uh, a woman who has a secure partner and is married mm -hmm. it's a lot smaller Mo most of them to my understanding it's over 80 percent of abortions are in non-married mm -hmm. uh relationships yeah of course yeah yeah well then so, that gets into a whole new topic right yeah right so, so, that, so we won't go there. that's that's my concern you have what are your mm -hmm. thoughts on that how do you prevent or protect against mm -hmm. unplanned pregnancies and stds when you're mm -hmm. with multiple people i guess i we sort of make up our own roles don't we? <laughs> <laughs> well i think i'll share first like if i may like infidelity happens you know like mm -hmm. it's for us it's not a question of how can we or in our, it's not a question of how, you know, how can we make monogamy perfect or whatever. It's like the reality is infidelity always happens. It has since the dawn of time. So mm -hmm. whether you, if every single person in the world was in a monogamous partnership, there's still always going to be extramarital sex or extramarital partnership or whatever. Sure. So for us, we're like, all right, well, we know that's not a possibility to achieve. So if we do feel we have different desires and want to explore life a different way what's not a possibility to achieve to, to have, have a monogamous relationship where you don't cheat on each other well for all people to have a monogamous for, relationship. yeah yeah obviously yeah. That well but right. i think it should be clear that we're not advocating for that type of marriage right you know that we're we're advocating for a radically different kind of marriage right that, that doesn't happen right right but go ahead but i guess we're speaking on the yeah. majority of yes. monogamous relationships yeah. in our current society probably are not anywhere nearly as beneficial and and, and connected healthy. and committed and yeah. healthy as yours as yours is so um yeah there's a lot of statistics and a lot of facts and i obviously don't know all of them perfectly but you know the reality is people who are non-monogamous relationships are no more likely to get stds or um yeah stds than people who are single living out you know just single life or you know not in a mm -hmm. committed monogamous partnership but just sleeping with other people yeah, yeah. Just dating. i mean i imagine well, that would be the same and that's, how many partners you have yeah if you have more partners right. you have a higher risk of contracting an STD. Yeah, if yeah. you have less partners, you have a lower risk. Yeah. If you have more sex, you're more likely to have an unplanned pregnancy. If you have less sex, I mean, it's well, just, with different people. Yeah. yeah. Well, just with anybody. Yeah. I'm just generally speaking. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't. Touch I don't, wood. We're, we're good. <laughs> Touch wood. <laughs> Yeah, we're just, I guess, to answer the question, we're just extra, you know, we're careful, we're careful and use protection like we would have, like I would have when I, before I was dating Matt or whatever. And um, yeah, we, everyone has their own methods of protection and we have ours. And um, yeah, like I said, it, it's always about consideration for the other person, you know, as much as it is for ourselves. So um, we talk about that in depth of, you know, this is why we use protection. And we, if we, if there was a slip up or an incident or something like that, you know, it, it's always clearly communicated or, and we would never want to risk giving something to our partner or anything like that. So yeah, of course it is a reality of not monogamy. It hasn't affected us personally. Um, yeah. Well, I think it, it boils down to kind of like what uh, we're advocating for mm -hmm. both of us, but I'm going to speak only to myself. Mm -hmm. So lots of the types of episodes I'm having on my podcast are about growth mindset, how to be the best, yeah. you know, your relationship yeah. <clears throat> and pa parenting. Right. So I would argue that our society at large is really suffering mm -hmm. because of, you know, like the high rates of unhappiness and divorce mm -hmm. and infidelity and all these things. Mm -hmm. But is it just because, oh, this isn't our biology. We're actually supposed to be non-monogamous mm -hmm. and in an ideal world, it would be like what you guys are doing. Mm -hmm. Or is it that in an ideal world, we would actually be like exp having a victor mindset, not a victim mindset, and having a much higher expectation for ourselves and our ability to grow and be the best version of ourselves, the best parents we can be, the best spouse we can be. If we were all living like that, how much better of a world that would be and how much better that would be for children growing in a stable home where their parents are madly in love with each other mm -hmm. and 
serve each other and sacrifice in a way that's obviously supporting yourself, but also helping others mm-hmm. and seeing that modeled to them of going out into the world like that. I imagine that would be a much different world, but that's mm-hmm. not the world we're seeing because there's so much brokenness in relationships. So is it because we're not designed to be in a relationship like that? Or is it because we're doing something wrong that's creating infidelity and creating cheating and dishonesty and all that stuff. Mm-hmm. So yeah. Yeah. That's it. I think the society is the problem because mm-hmm. the statistics in Australia alone, I think it's 2,500 men aged between 18 and 45 commit suicide every year. So something's wrong with the society. But I think as we broaden our awareness of different ways to express love and to express ourselves, people don't feel so suppressed within adopting things from the society same as with if we're cooking a meal at home and it's fit and we've like used maybe vegan meats or something and someone that's non-vegan comes in and goes oh, i can't believe you guys have cooked this way like there is an alternative so i think if we can get across that point that you can be monogamous you can be non-monogamous you can be anything that you want to you can express yourself in any means possible and then i think once we allow that and we become more receptive and accepting of other people then those statistics should especially for men i think men they've got to adhere to being fathers they've got all these titles and attachments that they have to adhere to and some men feel those expectations are too much they just can't fulfill these society expectations so they end their lives and yeah it's, it's just something that has to change it's just but I think that conversations like this, podcasts like this, to broaden our awareness that there's many ways that we can re- relate ourselves to other people and to our families and, and especially for like our children as well. I think with my kids, I'm always like, you can be whatever you want. You don't put yourself in these boxes. But I've said that from when they were like a very early age, you can express yourself in any form you want. So there's always that understanding that you don't have to conform to these constructs or place yourself in these boxes because I think when we do, we we have very little room to move. Mm -hmm. Well, I think just to answer that question uh, or that idea of like freedom and sexual freedom, it makes me think of the sexual revolution and how – you know, when that started happening, you know, decades ago, we have seen now through studies and very clearly that we're not happier. We're not actually more sexually free. We're we're not, the sexual freedom didn't actually make us happier. Mm -hmm. And this idea of, oh yeah, sleep with whoever and you don't need to wait till you're married. And because that was a much more common um, value a while ago than it is now. Now, if you wait till you're married to have sex, it's like almost unheard of. And it's looked at as this like, what even when we were dating Mm -hmm. he was made fun of by his friends it was still even back then Mm -hmm. considered so just imagine how it was decades ago and what it has become now is just we don't value that sacredness of the bond of a commit committed relationship Mm -hmm. being willing to grow and it hasn't made us happier Mm -hmm. we have higher rates of depression Mm -hmm. we have more uh, like a a single woman who has a baby Mm -hmm. with an unplanned pregnancy has a higher rates of poverty which isn't as good for the baby Mm -hmm. for the child growing up less likely to graduate high school and like anyone listening with that experience, of course, like you are amazing and everything you're doing, this is not to put down like your experience is just showing the realities of like, is this actually good for us to just sleep with whoever? And from what I'm seeing, it's clear that it's not, but obviously you guys are saying mm-hmm. something to her. You have anything to say? Well, it goes back to what you, the question of like, what is sex? Like, what is the purpose of it? Mm-hmm. What is, and I mean, for me, it's, I mean, pleasure is obviously part of it, but most, most, it's for procreation. I mean, that's biology. Mm-hmm. That's what sex mm-hmm. is for. And then uh, I believe it was created for the connection between the person you're mm-hmm. having it with and that mm-hmm. deeper connection that you can only share with a person you have sex with. Mm-hmm. Like there's just a different level of connection once you have sex with that person. Mm-hmm. That's why it was ultimately created. In your, in our opinion. And, yeah. And that's what <laughs> yeah. I believe. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And also just that it's the after sex too. Like with the whole, oh, with an extra partner, we may be – sending them off or I'm going to leave, I'm not going to stay in the bed. Mm-hmm. Part of that bond, I mean, from my experiences, our experiences, is the after too, that connection after. And it enriches our relationship as opposed to, okay, goodbye, I'm going to ba- go back to this relationship. But I think for mm-hmm. you guys, it's, see, I don't want to put words in your mouth, mm-hmm. but it seems like the sex is more, that's, that sexual experience enhanced my life, now I'm going to go back to my partner. Mm-hmm. Whereas for us, our sexual experience enhanced our relationship. Mm-hmm. But. I have a question. Yeah. Can I ask, and very clearly not to con- 
connect having sex and children at all, so separate subjects. But when you had your first son and you were pregnant with your second baby, did you fear that you wouldn't be able to love your second baby as much as you had first loved your first son, Elvis? I didn't have that fear, okay. but I know that that is a fear some people right. have. And right. then once they have their second baby, they realize that, at least from everyone I've spoken to, it's not that you have this infinite amount of love. Mm -hmm. And this might be where you're finite going. Amount of love. But yeah, finite amount of love where you go, oh, they already taken up all the space. Mm -hmm. Now when I have a new baby, like there's no more room. Right. But it just expands your expands. love. So I'm guessing that's where you're going yeah, with I, that. I, do. I believe that's possible. Like I love you with my whole heart and I love our lives together. And also I believe that. I love friends so much and I, you know, family and there's, I believe that it's possible to have a deep, deep, intimate connection and love and sexual connection and emotional connection with more, with more than one mm -hmm. person. And maybe it's not for everyone and maybe everyone's hearts and souls yeah. are different, but I believe for me, it's a possibility that there is room for expansion there and I can still achieve the same level of depth and connection with you and also know that it's a possibility that maybe one day I'll experience it with someone else too. Mm -hmm. so. The connection thing, it just... Like, I never really realized I could have a connection with other guys, mm -hmm. like, in the way that I do now. Right. Like, my friends growing up, it was more of just, like, you hang out, you have a good time together. Right. I didn't realize that I could have deeper connections with people that weren't my wife right. or even people of the same sex. Right. Like, that was just, like, a, a block I had. I don't know reason why. But right. I don't need sex to have, obviously, a connection. Right. And I don't think you're necessarily saying that. But it helped help open me up mm -hmm. to so many different things by being able to connect with people on a on a deeper level uh, and relationships. And I think I kind of learned that from being with her and having to learn how to love someone more than myself. Mm -hmm. And then obviously having children and then, then realizing that I can have connections with other people. And it would greatly improve my life and help me see new things. Right. And, mm -hmm. and I didn't. And I never really thought about needing sex for that. But. Yeah, and having children is like that too. And, you know, with your committed partner and having children, it teaches you how to love others more than yourself. Right. But to me, it seems like having, choosing this like, oh, this is what I want. This is what I need mm -hmm. without, for us, it seems like realizing the repercussions, potential repercussions, the greater mm -hmm. risk of repercussions. Then it's more like a, this is what satisfies me in the moment, mm -hmm. but is satisfying every urge is our impulse is actually good for us, good for society, good for mm -hmm. our children. Mm -hmm. And to us, it comes out at the end of the day that mm -hmm. it doesn't seem like it does. Mm -hmm. But for you guys, it seems like it would. Mm -hmm. And so it feels like kind of where we would end up leaving off. But do you have any? No, no. Final? All I was going to say is, yeah, I think for me personally, I feel sex is an expression of something of my, of like some in, innate deep love that I need to express. Mm -hmm. And I would do that not only with Amelia, but I would try and express this deepness of love to anyone that I meet, whether it's um, sexual or non-sexual, I would hope that I, that just myself would be able to somehow express that sort of love and mm -hmm. that deepness. Mm -hmm. But yeah. But I have one question, unless you have something else. No, 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 no. Please. Maybe just kind of to end it. Does, sure. I know just from speaking from my friends, not my own experience, mm -hmm. but friends who have had sex with people that they are close with, that they have often feel a sense of emptiness afterwards mm. that it wasn't actually meaningful mm. and it feels empty do you ever feel that way with a partner that you have where it felt like an empty um transaction that wasn't i know i don't want to use transaction because mm. you don't feel no, that no, way no, so no, let me take totally. that back no, that's fine. <clears throat> but an empty experience right. that wasn't as fulfilling as maybe you thought it would be yeah, and maybe this is like more of a conversation of should we have sex before marriage or should we have sex with multiple people because it's obviously like such different circumstances. But before being with Matt, definitely I had sexual experiences that left me feeling mm, feeling icky after or feeling like it wasn't an equal exchange of energy and connection. But no, I'd, I'd argue that since um, being together and it's almost like we, I don't want to say we value sex more, but we're extra um, intentional and extra deliberate and extra compassionate and extra considerate. And we don't want to, yeah, just simply because we don't need sex because we have it with each other. We don't need, so it's like, it's almost like an extra, I don't know, it's like an extra topping or something. So if we're going to do it outside of the relationship, we want to make sure it's done really well with, with integrity and empathy and compassion and you mentioned you know after a group sex experience something like that someone goes home or that's not our style at all like we believe it is a, a spiritual experience and connection and we want to make sure everyone's needs are feeling 
are being met and everyone's comfortable with the situation and it's common for us to follow up with people after or have them over for a dinner and you know the next night or whatever and create that space for how are you guys feeling are you feeling awkward or are you feeling embarrassed or did anything come up that you didn't feel good about and just feeling that all emotions are valid and we would rather explore all of them than not i guess explore all of them so yeah and i think that if you're having emptiness like sex that's meaningless then you're attracting that like that's you attracting like attracting like mm-hmm. so if we're attracting people that we're having emptiness meaningless sex with we've, we've got to take a deeper look at ourselves mm-hmm. at who and i think that's the perfect gauge i think when we go on dates who we attract to, to us gives us a gate like a self-reflective gauge on this person's amazing and look who i've attracted into my life they're loving and caring and they're so deep and and I think then it's like this gauge, whereas if you're meeting someone, they're like, let's just get drunk over it, you know, and let's just have sex. It's like, is that me? So I think it's a, it's kind of like a gauge, isn't it? You mm-hmm. can use connection as, a, as such a self-reflective gauge, like nothing else, like there's nothing else that can give you such. And, we, and, and using our, each other as these self-reflective gauges as well. Yeah. So I have one more question, actually. Um what is your plan or your thoughts on how it is quite common then for and even in a monogamous relationship where they cheat and there's infidelity quite most of the time it's because they're not getting something fulfilled in their marriage Mm -hmm. so they seek outside uh Mm -hmm. sexual experiences and then there's the butterflies and the chemistry and Mm -hmm. you don't have all the baggage of the i know exactly oh i hate the way this person does this and this and this and this person isn't like that but really you just don't know the person every person has their flaws that you end up starting to fall in love with somebody else Mm -hmm. and you fall essentially out of love of Mm -hmm. that or you have already fallen out of love with that person Mm -hmm. instead of working on that relationship to fall back in love and Mm -hmm. to stay in unconditional love because do you ever what are your thoughts on that like if you start dating someone you have sex with them and Mm -hmm. you feel all the butterfly feelings that maybe 15 years down the road 10 years down the road you don't have with Mm -hmm. each other anymore because Mm -hmm. of just the natural changes that happen within Mm -hmm. a relationship the longer you know know each other and that's in with sisterhood and family you know the person like the back of your hand so it's a lot more relaxed it's not as putting your best foot forward you're more likely to be your less best version of yourself right right? so how common it is to go to that person and think oh well this is actually the person for me like we you know we know scenarios like that where this is not actually the person for me but really over time that person isn't you don't feel that same you end up feeling the same thing you felt with the first person Mm -hmm. because over time if you don't work on yourself and you're just looking at like the oh you're this way you're not providing the needs that I want anymore. Mm-hmm. You're no longer what I need. Then it ends up going from person to person. And mm-hmm. if you bring kids into that relationship, that's where it ends up making it. That's why there's a higher likelihood mm-hmm. of if you open the relationship to have a higher divorce rate, which mm-hmm. isn't good for kids mm-hmm. in general. Mm-hmm. So, well, yeah. I also question those statistics um, mm-hmm. in, in honesty, simply because most non-monogamous people, they're less likely to be married. And also I feel like just being who we are and the mindset we have and the perspective on life, what really is marriage to non-monogamous people, it's probably very different. Mm-hmm. So I kind of question, you know, most monogamous marriages end in, in divorce. Or for us, it's like we say we were married, but we weren't really legally married. So yeah. where do we fall on that? Yeah, this boundary, is focusing you know? on like marriages who chose to open up to their open relationship up. Okay. or they were married and o- were open all the time. Into account didn't take into account if extra. They if they started didn't. as non-monogamous, mm-hmm. it just takes into account marriages and that, that open. at some that point open, open the relationship okay, and yeah. I think as well lust is when we meet someone new and it's mm. like that new feeling it's just lust I mean we all have love and the way that we express it but being drawn to someone with that new energy and that lust you can you can understand it and you can understand like unconditional love very different mm. and we've been able to communicate that like Totally. struggles with lust it's like oh, i want to spend so much time with this other person and so it's like yeah we can evaluate whether it's lust or whether it's like a really deep connection worth pursuing right, right. and like what you said we know 15 years down the line we know each other like the back of our hand we know how we use the toilet and whatever yeah. like how <laughs> it's we not the same pick our wedgies and yeah. yeah it's not the same or just so. they have this tone with me all the time and right like this person doesn't have that tone with right. me yeah. without remembering that like you guys didn't have that tone in the beginning of your relationship totally you know yeah, yeah. i think it's just a, a bit more of awareness of okay i can meet a new guy out next weekend but and he feels he, he feels amazing and he seems incredible but I don't know what he's been like for the last five years. Like, I don't know what his life's looked like. I don't know how he's chose to act in challenging times or shut up for family or friends. And so I think it's very similar to how you guys feel in times of maybe turbulence or trouble within the marriage is, 
I'm, I'm going to come back to you more than likely because I love you and I know that we're working towards a shared life together. And, um, and then, and also at the same time is our beliefs are more things happen for a reason and as they're meant to. And for us, I think unconditional love is there are no boundaries or no rules or, um, guidelines. Well, there, of course there are guidelines, but no, no, um, you're never allowed to do this ever. And so that is a reality that we talk about of what if you meet someone new in 10 years or 15 or 30 years. And I would like to sit here and think from this position that I love you so much that no matter what is best for you, whether it's in a, a partnership with me or with someone else, I would be able to open my heart and, and give you the love and the support you need to be able to do what's best for, for him and his life. And I'm sure your views are very different. <laughs> yeah, because it comes back to like children too right, you know right. yeah but also and i go back to my parents of like they made those sacred vows in the catholic church of till death yeah. do us part and then it was probably because of us my sisters and i that they decided the healthiest thing to do for our family is to end this marriage so mm. I and guess we can't speak to like their personal experience just know like the broader understanding of, course, of what yeah. divorce gen- like often generally right. does to kids right yeah yeah, yeah. definitely yeah so do you have anything what's else the to say? number one reason people get married is just differences it's not even normal you mean get divorced yeah get divorced, get divorced. it's just yeah. they grew apart at least that's what people put right. on their yeah, divorce yeah. app or right. whatever the forms they have to fill out right. uh which is really sad really it's like if, if both people are working on themselves that will never happen obviously mm-hmm, there's right. infidelity and things like that but that, but that happened that's a that's a like a result of this mm-hmm. not yeah. working on mm-hmm. each other's selves together mm-hmm. So, I mean, what's good for society? What's good for the next generation of people? I mean, going into a relationship, being on the same page and being in a, whether whether it's an open relationship or a committed monogamous relationship, like really families aren't going to be better. Society's not going to be better unless both people in a relationship mm-hmm. are have the same growth mindset, like you had yeah. mentioned, want to become better. Mm-hmm. Um, but at the same time, you, you brought up everything happens for a reason, but sometimes we put ourselves into situations mm. that cause those things to happen. Mm-hmm. Like, okay, so we had an unplanned pregnancy. Well, it happens for a reason. Well, you chose to have sex with someone and then it resulted in an right. unplanned pregnancy. Right. So there's obviously like certain things do happen for right. a reason. I believe things, everything yeah. happens for yes. a reason, but sometimes it's because we put ourselves in those situations. So what I, my, what I would teach my kids is don't put yourself in situations that are going to increase your chances of having an outcome that you don't want. So if you don't want to have unplanned pregnancies, if you don't want to increase your risk of STDs, then I would try to find a girl and try to try to stick to a monogamous relationship. But if that's not something you're worried about, I mean, obviously you can make everyone can make their own choices and consensual and, uh, but yeah. And I think also, like, we mentioned society and children and stuff, but mm-hmm. we don't want to neglect, like, the self as well. Like, it's really, we also think, like, the importance of the self. You don't want to be miserable in a marriage, and you don't want to be just like, oh, oh, I got to suffer through That's not what we're advocating for. I mm-hmm. just hope that's clear, that, like, we're advocating for, like, a really healthy relationship where you're willing to grow. Of and so that's just something you don't often see. So we're ad- we're advocating for, like, a radically different marriage than I think right. most are doing. Right, which is amazing and yeah. so important to say, yeah. too, because it's, it's, it's... And it's hard work. Right. You know, it would be easier. It could be easier to be like, mm, at certain times in your life, right? Mm-hmm. To be like, is this might be, I think this isn't for me, but is that actually best? Is it best mm-hmm. for you? Is it best mm-hmm. for you? There's so many things to question of if it is, it's actually best just mm-hmm. because it doesn't feel right in the mm-hmm. moment, you know, and being able to like work on the self. And mm-hmm. that's where we come back to is like working on the self for each other totally. to make your relationship stronger. Yeah, yeah totally. you definitely got to work on the self. Yeah. That is the most, yeah, I guess that, yeah, that was part and parcel of, the my monogamous relationship was was we weren't working on ourselves. We mm. were too ingrained in in what the kids were doing. Mm. So yeah, it's definitely important. And it's also ingrained in maybe like what you aren't doing. You aren't doing this. Right. You aren't instead of what am I not doing yeah, or exactly. what am I doing that I can change? Because it sh- your communication shifts completely with your relationship. The way that you communicate. How am I approaching a conflict? It's just the simplest things like that. Totally. Am I approaching it on guard? Am I approaching it like with my walls up? Am I having this high negative energy? Am I being prideful? Mm-hmm. You know, like the pride and the ego versus the facts of the situation. You know, all of that comes into play of how your relationship unfolds. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think of, oh, well, you know, I believe in the Bible. And I just think of what God's version of marriage is and what he commands the husband to, what kind of husband he commands 
him to be to his wife. Mm -hmm. And it says you're supposed to love your wife like Jesus loved the church. And what did Jesus do? Jesus came to earth and he died for, for everybody. Mm -hmm. So what are we, what are husbands called to do? They're called to be like Jesus. And if Jesus was perfect. <laughs> so he's calling us to perfection. If everyone had that desire, like I'm going to try to be perfect for my wife, mm -hmm. I'm going to, you know, uh, Obviously, there's going to be times where it's not going to be perfect, obviously, but yeah. uh, that's what the command is. And, if, and that's what we want to push for is like if everyone on each side of the relationship pushed to try to be the best possible partner they can be and put the other person's needs first, if she's putting my needs first, then I'm going to have my needs met. Oh, and if I put her best. needs first, then her needs are going to be met and we don't have to think, well, I have to do this. She's just automatically going to do that. Mm -hmm. Obviously, it's, it takes a lot, a lot of work. And a lot of people aren't willing to put in that work mm -hmm. or don't really realize that that's, that's when relationships work best, mm -hmm. when is when both partners are giving their full to the relationship because then naturally your needs are going to be met. Obviously, you have to have open communication and honesty and mm -hmm. all that as well. And that's where the fireworks happen for us. Like when we are doing that, we're putting the other first. We're doing – we are doing that exactly and focusing on each other and loving each other in that way. That's when like our bond is incredible and mm -hmm. we're on fire and when we're not, when it's the selfish, selfish, my, me, me, what do I need? That's that's when it falls apart. And mm -hmm. so I think so many relationships. Yeah, when we like start that. comparing, like, well, I did this and this and this. What did you do for me? Yeah, it's not a good good spot to not be. Not a good Exactly. <laughs> and then you're going to find that new, oh, well, that person, she's doing all these great things for me. When really, it's just because you put your best self forward mm -hmm. in the beginning, you know, and then that the way it ends up, you just get more and more comfortable mm -hmm. and you get more relaxed. And that's where relationships start to downhill totally until, until you realize that's not gonna help you you have to continue to put your best foot forward for each other and for yourself right because then your fireworks are amazing and you only need each other mm -hmm. that's not to say there isn't you know the obvious reality is of attraction but is that good for our relationship mm -hmm. we obviously conclude no mm -hmm. but you guys mm -hmm. conclude differently <laughs> yeah absolutely and we just want to say i mean or me personally but I so much of your lifestyle and your home and your family together inspires me tremendously and I think it's so beautiful what you both have created together in your family and your home and the way you raise your children and we want to carry so much of that into our lives too so it's amazing it's such an honor to sit here and have this conversation with you too because we truly value your opinion and see the product of all of your work and intention over the the result excuse me of all of your work and intention and it's cool. It's it's amazing to sit here and think we're four different people, and but we want something so similar and also different in our own ways. And mm -hmm. I guess that's kind of what we can just end it on or advocate on yeah. is yeah. we believe that you know there's there's room for everyone on that spectrum. I said, and um, but obviously love, compassion, commu communication, yeah. trust, foundation. Like we we have so many of those same values as well. Yeah, we just, absolutely. Well, yes, express them course. differently. Yeah. Thank yeah, you. We think you guys are amazing. I love the intention behind your. Um, quality of life and wanting to be your best version of yourself, you know. I think it's amazing and I appreciate like your respectfulness and love and openness. And op yeah, I was going to say your openness and honesty and just willing to just be yourself. Yeah. Like, so many people are so <laughs> guarded in mm. conversations and stuff. So thanks for yeah, coming on. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. We I think we're it. good. I think this is a great way to end it. Cool. Yeah, thank you really so good. much for coming oh, on. It was so much fun. Yes.